Well, hello, I'm Pastor Aaron Bauer, and I'm glad that you've joined us for our online worship service this weekend. Uh, my prayer is that God would just bless you, reach out to you, call you back out. Some of you are using an online service like this to remember um, Jesus, to, to continue to worship Jesus. Others of you are maybe confused why you're here. It was just shared with you or or whatever. But what we want you to experience is that you're brought into and, and connected into the body of Christ. That's a really interesting metaphor. If we are Christ's body, then he is the head, then how do we then respond as a people? What's the shape of that? And that's what we'll look at today in our passage. What's the shape of the message? What's the shape of the body of Jesus? And we'll kind of do a little physical checkup on all that to see where we're at. And so we want to invite you to join with us, whether that's coming to a men's breakfast that's uh, coming up shortly, or maybe you want to join a, a Bible study that's going on on Wednesday nights or or whatever, just check out our bulletin. We'll, we'll make sure you have access to those things, isqua.cc slash bulletin or slash give or connect. There's lots of ways to, to connect with us online. Maybe you want to do a service project and you could join me on the second Tuesday of the month and we'll meet at Revel Issaqua at 9 a.m. and we'll serve the poor of the world together uh, with Gateway Medical Alliance. There's, there's no shortage of ways to get plugged in and get involved, but we want you to be connected. We love you. And we want the best for you. And we think the best for you is to be with other people in the body of Christ, pulling together, strengthening one another, working the kinks out, figuring out what it looks like to follow Jesus together. So may God richly bless you today. It's probably been a bit since you've had someone just read scripture to you. And this passage in Acts chapter 26 is uh, pretty pretty amazing. And what I'd like to do is just read it to you. We'll come back with a sermon and, and all that. But I just want to read... Acts chapter 26, for you. So Agrippa said to Paul, this is King Agrippa in a trial type setting, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope, in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by the Jews. O king, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At, at midday, O king, I saw... On the way, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God." that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. 
Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus, the governor, said with a loud voice, interrupted him, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose and the governor with and Bernice and those who were sitting with them and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Acts 26. This is the word of the Lord. You can trust it. I was at a dinner party conversation the other night, and maybe you've experienced this as well. How are you doing? Oh, I'm old. Everything hurts. Right? You hear that a lot? You feel that a lot? Right? Sometimes when uh, when I engage in some hearty work, you know, lumberjack stuff or, or play, I still do ultimate frisbee and basketball and stuff like that, I have to make decisions for how to get my body healing and growing in the right direction, right? And it starts with good posture, which I'm learning. I stretch in my hot tub. And then on the floor with, with my trusty foam roller on my back and shoulders. And, and sometimes I, I lay myself in bed on this little neck roll and, and try to get all my bones to rest in the correct order. Because why? I want to function better the next day with stronger muscles, but holding those bones in the right way, right? So I want you to think about this. What does Jesus do when his body hurts his body <laughs> well we are the body of christ of which he is the head and when we're being attacked abused or even just atrophied jesus takes corrective action he wants to prove your faith our faith in him genuine and to mature us and grow us into the correct shape. What's the correct shape? Well, it's the mature Christ-like shape. So are you content with immature faith, atrophied moral muscles, misshapen spiritual formation? Jesus is not content with that. And so let's look today at, at Jesus through the story of Paul, as he continues his witness to the powerful in his trial before King Agrippa and the governor Festus. Um, Paul, Paul isn't just giving his legal defense here. He's giving a prophetic sermon. He's pulling it all out. And, and I, so as we read through this, I want to unpack this for you. Acts 26, 12 through 32 is what we'll focus on today. He's talking about his persecution of the, of the Christians. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way 
a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we'd fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I can stop here. Uh, a couple things. Paul is, is, is hearing directly from Jesus that Jesus feels the pain of his body. He says, you are persecuting me. Now, Jesus is on the throne. He's not assailable. You can't come after him or, or can you because his body is here, the body of Christ. God is making a new resurrected humanity. And, and you're going to stand in the way of that? He's saying to Paul. The, the new work of resurrection has begun and you're trying to shut it down by persecuting the church? A goad is just the pointy stick that keeps the ox going in the in the correct direction. And God has a vision for how things should go and, and how his church should form and how it should be shaped. And, and you're going to go against that? I'm seriously, you? Or Paul? Me? Are we going against the, the vision for how his church would grow? Hmm. Paul says in response to him, Who are you, Lord? Identifying that if he's if he's in the vision, he's on the throne, he is his Lord. And, and the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet. I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you've seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. So what he has seen and, and what he will see in future visions, right? Catch this, delivering you from your people and the Gentiles. There was a certain subset of, of the population uh, of the Jewish people who were really trying to shut this down, as Paul was. He, he was a part of them. He gets it. He understands. But, but God says, I will deliver you. Jesus is going to deliver you from your people and from the Gentiles, the Goyim, the nations, the, the fa all the families of the earth. So, so if we've been wondering where, where Paul gets his resolve to keep on keeping on, even when it seems he's dead meat. Remember those times he was, he was almost killed or caught up um, after he was executed and, and by stoning. And, and he's like, okay, well, where are you going? Well, I'm going back into the city. They just stoned you in there. Well, Jesus is going to deliver me from all of this. And this focus of this promise that anchors him will be picked up next week. But it's worth realizing the foundation of it today. Paul knows he's going to be delivered. Delivering you from your people and the, from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Listen, to open their eyes. So that they may turn from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to, to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified, being, being made right and pure and holy by faith, by allegiance in me. So they're going to receive forgiveness of sins and a place among the sanctified, the, the holy people, because of their allegiance in, in Jesus. <laughs> this is news, and, and actually it's, it's combative news. The, the crowd overhearing this doesn't want to hear it because, because they're... they're they're the nations. They're the idolaters. But, but he's saying, no, these Gentile Christians are not dirty idolaters in league with the devil. They're, they're cleansed by faith. <laughs> A pure Gentile, they would mock? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Without temple, priest, and sacrifice? Actually, allegiance to Jesus accomplishes all of that. You're no longer captive to Satan. No longer bound by darkness. You've turned to, to face God in the, in the true light. So is that the case of the body of Christ today? Well, the, you say the true body of Christ for sure, but those who claim to be the body of Christ, are, are we cooperating with darkness as the world tries to force us into its mold? These are tough questions. Uh, Paul, Paul is celebrating the freedom and the transformation of this, this people from darkness to light in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and 10. He says, 
Uh, for they themselves report uh, concerning the kind of reception we've had among you, how you've turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he rescued from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, Paul has seen the light, right? <laughs> Brighter than the noonday sun, and he'd be a fool not to respond to it. He, he goes on, he says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient, to the heavenly vision. Uh, this, this may be the key of the entire speech, and it's certainly a central point of the book of Acts. Kind of this mindset that's like, well, you be the judge, man. Should we obey man or, or should we obey God? He's saying, I've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. And, and this heavenly vision includes God's plan to make a people for himself out of all the peoples on the earth, to make them into one body, the body of of Jesus. Are you catching this? It's the body of Jesus that feels the pain. and the... Okay, more, we'll, we'll, we'll work on this later. Uh, but therefore, he goes on, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout the region of Judea, also to the Gentiles, that they should, listen, repent and turn to God. Repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. But show me your repentance again. Oh, by, by my deeds. It's a big theme in the, in the book of Acts that, that God is bringing the Jewish people to himself and also bringing the nations back. The Jewish people, you're, you're the chosen family to bring in all the families. Back to Genesis 12. I will bless you and make you a blessing. All families on the earth will be blessed through you. You're chosen to be a blessing. And did you know, were you told that repentance is a long-term process? Were you told that? We'll come back and talk about this idea of repentance in, in a minute. Uh, but he goes on, For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. That the Christ must suffer, and that by being first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. <laughs> so that's the shape of the message of Jesus. And we'll come back to that in a minute. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, he shouts him down, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I'm speaking true in rational words. Hmm. For the king knows about these things, and I speak boldly to him. For I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. This hasn't been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. <laughs> and Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am. Well, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man's doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now, let's go back and pick up some of the breadcrumbs I've left and look at what shape the body of Christ is in and what is the shape of the message of Jesus. So what's the shape of the body of Christ then and now? But then what is the shape of the message of Jesus? So for the shape of the body of Christ, um, I just want to start with some pesky pastor questions. Are you in the body of Christ? Through allegiance to Jesus, are you sanctified, brought from darkness to light, forgiveness? Are you in the body of Christ? If so, are you responsive to the head? Christ is the head of the church. Do you more maybe reflect spastic behavior not directed by the head? Or are we, as a people, so closely identified with Jesus that to injure us is, 
is to injure him. To malign us is to malign Jesus. Is Jesus saying, well, she's one of mine. I, I felt that. Or do we have that kind of alignment? I, I want us to listen into Paul's heart through some letters he wrote. This is, the, this is the Father's heart to see us become like Jesus. In Galatians 4.19, Paul calls the church, My little children, from whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. To, to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 4.11-13, through 13, God, Jesus gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ. How's your posture? How's our posture? Are we filling out to the to the mature stature of Christ? Philippians 1, 3 through 6 gives some hope for us here. He writes to Philippi, I thank my God and my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So (laughs) are we mature yet? Well, no. When will it happen? On the day of Christ. But are we increasing, growing, stretching out, getting those muscles and the skeletal system in line? I sometimes worry for the church in America that we've adopted what has been called cheap grace. Like, oh, I'm so glad I got away with that sin. I'm so glad that my, I'm not held accountable for my sin anymore. And and I, now it's, it's all, you know, just faith and grace. And it's all, and then I can just live however I want. I don't, do, do we, do some people think that way? It comes across that, wow, we got away with it, you know. But that's a cheap grace. But, but is our, heart and mind turned away from sin and maybe it is maybe we're like okay i want to i want to not do the sinful things great good 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 but is it turned toward christ or are we sort of in a middle ground so you you turned from sin to what well to just not be a sinner no no we turn toward christ does that make sense because the church is being responsive and obedient to Jesus. So would you say that our church is responsive to the head that is Christ, obedient to Jesus? Are we tied into his mind and his love for us? Are, are we tuned into what breaks God's heart of justice? God's heart of love, even as he's tuned into our suffering. Where, where's the mutuality? We learn from him. Uh, in this passage, that, that to persecute Jesus is to pain him. Jesus feels our suffering because it's his body that hurts. In fact, we're told, what, to cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. It's First Peter 5, 7. Maybe that's what you needed to hear. Jesus gets it. He feels your pain. He knows what's going on. He recognizes the difficulty, the how everything just doesn't feel quite right. He gets that. And we're doing life together to strengthen each other and to encourage one another all the more to do good works. This passage shows us that it's not a cheap grace. We're meant to do works in keeping with repentance. That word in Greek is metanoia. It's a change of mind and a change of direction based on the shape of the message. Uh, Like a chiropractor or physical therapist getting everything set so that it can grow straight. Our repentance is solidified by our activity and our direction. Our spiritual muscles grow and experience mutual support from a properly aligned skeleton. 
Dean Penter serves an Anglican congregation as well as his professor work and a, a book writing and such. Listen in to this tradition, it's maybe foreign to you, about repentance. He says, repentance requires reorientation. And there are a variety of ways that I try to express the implications of repentance in the context of parish ministry. For example, when we baptize new Christians in full view of the congregation, I have the candidates face west when I ask them these three questions. Do you renounce Satan? and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? Then I have them turn and face east before I ask them the next three questions. Do you turn to Jesus and accept him as your Savior? Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? Do you promise to obey him as your Lord? Can you see that reorientation from the power of Satan to the power of God? A transition in full view of everyone else, a renunciation and a reorientation. Does you get that? That's, that's a big deal. Okay, maybe you don't have that in your tradition, but that's built into the fabric of what we're even talking about with baptism, which if you have not been baptized and haven't made this switch, talk to me. We need to figure this out. Because metanoia is this repentance word is a change of mind and a change of direction based on the shape of the message, what, that Jesus is Lord. So, Pesky pastor question, are, are we doing all in the name of Jesus? Are we aligning with him and saying, okay, this is what he wants, so I'm going to I'm gonna head out and do it? Or are we kicking against the goads, the, the sharp sticks that are meant to keep us in line in the shape and the direction of the will of Jesus? Because I have bad news and good news. And the bad news is the world, the flesh, and the devil are doing everything possible to squeeze us into its mold. And if we're not under the power of Jesus, default, we are under the power of Satan. He's the only one that can rescue us from that. And if you haven't asked him to rescue, he's not done it. Rescue from the power of Satan to the power of Jesus. And we need to sit with that. That if we're not under the power of Jesus, we're under the power of Satan. We learn that from scripture today. And that's the bad news. The good news is, all heaven is directing us toward alignment with Jesus, growing in the right direction, strengthening in the right way to, toward maturity in Christ-likeness. So that's the shape of the body. There's still some questions in there. How are we shaping up? Are we becoming like Jesus? Is this, is this taking place like we know it should take place? Are we allowing God to complete the work? But then let's just listen again to the shape of the message. Paul's gospel message had, a, had about six parts. First, Paul's message is, is shaped in Israel's scriptures. This is from the prophets. Remember Moses and the prophets. Second, it's a message about Jesus as Messiah. Oh, the expected coming ruler, the, the Messiah. But third, it's a message about the suffering Messiah. Oh, he must suffer. And that he would forth rise from the dead. Be the first to rise from the dead. Resurrection. And fifth, this message was about God's light shining on all people alike. Again, not just the chosen people, but, but it was an Israel-shaped plan. You, I hope you can see that. Creator God is using an Israel-shaped plan to bring about the worship of all created order. Right? And six, then, and this we just kind of have to go back to the start to, to pick up. It's the vision is Jesus on the throne. This Jesus, this scripturally promised suffering, risen, missionary Messiah is the human glorious face of the one true and living God. I like how Tom Wright summarized that last little bit there. The Jesus, the scripturally promised, suffering, risen, and missionary Messiah is the human glorious face of the one true and living God. <laughs> and he is the head. What kind of world are we in? Dare I say that the world needs from you, what the world needs from us is, is our passion 
for Jesus. Our responsiveness to the head. Because it, it's, it's our response to the heavenly vision. It's our works in keeping with our repentance. That's how we'll grow into the shape that is Jesus and to represent the glorious Savior to an otherwise blind, captive, and darkened world. Allow me to close with Paul's words about how this body life is supposed to take place and how we can love each other and not, get this, grieve the heart of God. Let us not be causing pain to Christ. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32, as I close. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we're members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Building up. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you.
We have so much to celebrate in communion together. <laughs> we are members of one another. Christ forgave us and we forgive one another. You know, one of the main warnings that comes out of this communion message in 1 Corinthians is, wait, are you not in communion with a brother? Have you wronged them? Have you spoke maliciously about them? Have you slandered them? Go make that right. Don't pretend communion when it's not there because we are members of one another, right? But if you need to pause this and go make a phone call and make things right, then do that first. But assuming that we've been sanctified and we've been cleaned through our allegiance to Jesus, we've been forgiven of our sins, we take with him and eat. He says, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Hmm. Jesus, we celebrate you. We salute you. We hoist the cup of the new covenant and we say, thank you that you are our suffering and risen missionary Messiah. Thanks for seeking us out and drawing us into the family of God. We covenant with you to be those people who do works in keeping with our repentance so the world can see you even more clearly as your body keeps in step with you, the head. We covenant with you, Jesus. This is the new covenant, Jesus said, in his blood. Do this in remembrance of him. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our
Thanks a bunch for joining us. We're glad that you're using this sort of method to make a connection with Jesus and with his people. Uh, You know, we don't want dismembered bodies coming out of Halloween. We just, I'm done with seeing those laying around in mailboxes and whatever, (laughs) dismembered body parts. Let's remember. Let us come back and put back into the body those who are straying, those who are feeling weak and atrophied and abused and struggling. Come back into the body of Christ. Uh, There's a spot for you. If not at Issaquah Christian Church, at a local church near you. Join in with the body and remember. Be Be a part again. Remember who Jesus is, the head of his body, Yes, that's us, the body of Christ. So may God richly bless you until we meet again.